Hey everybody, John Lorden here. Welcome to another Brain Scratch Searchlight. Uh, today we are going to continue looking into the case of William John Ward, also known as BJ. Uh, if you guys saw last week's episode, uh, I reached out to the family through the video saying that if there was any information that they could give us to help us clarify this or anything else they wanted to share to please reach out to me. I did get contacted uh, by Jancy, first of all, who I mentioned in that video, and she had already spoken to BJ's mother and sister about me contacting them and got the okay there. So I have spoken to all three of them at this point. Uh, if you didn't see last week's episode, I have it in the description box below. So you might want to check that out before you continue uh, on this video because some of the context might not make a lot of sense. But um, unfortunately, none of them felt comfortable coming on to uh, the show in terms of being filmed and then having that released on YouTube. But they did have information they wanted to get out there. So I did all of these interviews via phone, kind of the old school way that we used to do it about a year ago. Um, and I've taken a bunch of good notes. We have a lot of information to cover. So Let's just go ahead and jump right in and get started on that. First of all, there were two major points that his family wanted to clear up that I had mentioned in the last video. The first was about him wandering into the neighbor's house. Uh, I have the neighbor's name, but I haven't seen it published anywhere, so I'm going to try to preserve their privacy. We are just going to call this neighbor T. And uh, there are multiple homes on this property. There's another one that comes into play. We're going to call that um, person J. Okay, so uh, T is the person that BJ went and asked if he could call uh, his mother. And T says that BJ seemed to be in a bit of a frantic state. Um, he was already missing his shoes at that point. There's a little bit of discrepancy. Some people seem to recall that T says that he gave BJ some water, that he uh, filled up a bottle that BJ had. Other people say, well, no, I was told from T that uh, he gave BJ uh, two bottles of water. Uh, someone else says, uh, no, you know, T said that he didn't give BJ any water at all. So just some weird discrepancies in terms of the storytelling from this person that did interact uh, with BJ. But his mother is fairly certain that um, BJ was there. She mentioned to me several times that she actually heard him in the background, but he wouldn't get on the phone with her. Um, he seemed like he was in too much of a rush to continue heading towards Walmart for some reason. Now, uh, a family member of T, the one that I mentioned before that we're calling Jay, who also has uh, a home. I, I don't know if it's exactly on this property or on a neighboring property, but he had a surveillance system and he's the one that got footage of BJ running through. Uh, according to Jancy's explanation of that footage, it seems like um, BJ was really booking it. Like he seemed like he was running away from something, but the footage didn't show anything for him to be running away from. Uh, the footage did confirm that his shoes were indeed missing at that point as well. Now, Jancy tells me um, several weeks later, the shoes showed up and I actually have a picture of it here. Um, and they showed up just kind of in the middle of this, uh, what looks like a, a walking path. According to Jancy, that area had been searched before and the shoes weren't there. BJ's mother and sister did not quite confirm that information in the same way. So I'm just going to note that as a little bit of a discrepancy, but um, the shoes we can see, here's a close up of the shoes. Um, I don't know why he would have removed these shoes. They seem like they were perfectly fine. Uh, one interesting story that maybe ties into this uh, BJ's mom actually told me that she had contact with him earlier that morning. He had texted her and he actually scared her. He was saying that um, she needed to call him right away and she was really nervous about what he was going through. Uh, she got a hold of him and he said that he had coughed up a tick and he was kind of freaked out by that. Um, I don't know if possibly he thought that there were ticks in his shoes or something like that. Maybe that could be some reason why he, he left those behind. 
Now, I don't want to get into too much details that some people might consider personal here, but let's just be clear that BJ is dealing with an emotional disorder. He's taking medications for that. Uh, we've looked into that on this channel in a few cases. Sometimes these medications can have some pretty bizarre side effects. So is there a possibility that we're seeing some type of psychosis possibly as a side effect of medication or perhaps what the issues that he's facing? I think we have to consider that. However, uh, something prompted him to remove his shoes. We're still not sure what. And Jancy is very curious about how the shoes were found, uh, especially considering that that area was likely searched. So does that potentially point towards a foul play scenario? It might, it might not. Uh, according to Jancy, uh, her vibe from the investigators on this was that, uh, you know, he was running so fast and they have some really serious mud, uh, almost like quicksand. They, I guess it's called quick mud out there. And his shoes could have gotten stuck in that and he could have run right out of his shoes. Uh, based on the photos that I'm seeing, it doesn't really look like they're all, I mean, they look like they're dirty, but it doesn't look to me like they were caked in mud and kind of stuck in something that way. So I'm really not positive if I personally subscribe to that theory or not. But regardless, we know that when he did get to that neighbor's house to make the phone call to his mother, um, he was already missing his shoes. His mother's pretty sure she heard him in the background. Um, and the person T actually said, do you want to talk to your mother? And he said, no, 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 I have to get to Walmart. Now, the information that um, his mother and sister had, Karen, I'm going to finally start using their names. His mother's name is Karen. His sister is Mandy. Um, they had spoken to his girlfriend, uh, Tori. I know her name has been released publicly. And basically that morning, uh, according to Tori, he just said he's going out and he'll be back later. She really didn't have any idea where he was going, what he was doing, uh, apparently even how long he'd be away, at least according to the information that I'm getting from Karen and Mandy. So a bit interesting. And I have to tell you, um, you know, I've kind of, sometimes these cases fall into what I consider like Facebook drama territory. I've been contacted by some people that want to remain anonymous that are giving me kind of tidbits that they're hearing about, you know, they're close to this situation. Uh, they've heard this, they've heard that there's a lot of stuff that is kind of buzzing around Tori. Uh, even some stories that I've heard that I just don't quite understand, but I can't really figure a scenario where Tori is somehow involved in his disappearance um, directly or anything like that. So yes, I feel like there's something strange there. I'm not sure if she's on the up and up. I don't know why, but uh, I've really gone through this as hard as I could with both Karen and Mandy, and I could not figure the, just the physical logistics, just the logic that it would take to try to say, you know, Tori is involved in his disappearance in some way. There is a very interesting aspect to this case, which is Tori is pregnant. And according to what Karen and Mandy told me was her due date, um, she got pregnant probably at some point in June. Uh, the official story is that BJ did not know about this. Uh, what I was wondering, this thing that I keep sensing when I'm listening to the story over and over is I'm wondering about that phone call that he had with Tori, the one where she says the phone kind of broke up. Uh, and by the way, everyone I spoke to confirmed that cell phone signals are terrible in this area. Like one of them told me they had to stand on top of a car to get a cell phone signal just, and it would only hold for a few moments. So uh, in terms of pings, we really, I don't know if we could lean on that to say this is where he, I mean, they have a last ping, but I don't think we could say, well, this is obviously where something happened to him because the cell phone service out there is so bad. He might've continued past that point and just didn't hit another tower. Um, but back to, back to Tori. So just kind of strange things around that. I'll put the offer out in this video too. Tori, if you see this video and you want to clear some of this up, uh, you want me to run these questions by you so you can make some clarifications, um, please let me know. But of course, with, with her being pregnant, um, you know, I'm not looking to upset anyone or anything like that. And like I said, the information that I'm reviewing does not point to Tori being involved in his disappearance in any way. But I was wondering, could they have potentially had an argument 
Um, did she possibly tell him that she was pregnant and he got upset and he left and maybe she feels somewhat responsible because, you know, he's now missing. No one knows where he's been for several months. Uh, maybe something along those lines at most, but I'm not detecting anything outside of that. So something else that I didn't quite get before is apparently when he called Tori and spoke to her, uh, he didn't just say, I need help, call mom. He actually said, I need help. I lost the keys. And I believe this is a Dodge Durango, if I recall correctly, um, that used to belong to his mother and she had basically given it to BJ and Tori so they had a vehicle. Uh, so it makes sense that he might have said call mom because I believe she had another key uh, and she was going to drive down with that. So now we at least get a little bit of sense of what's going on. Uh, what's really curious about that is when they did find the Durango, um, they noticed it was unlocked and his wallet was still inside of it as well as a full pack of cigarettes. And uh, Mandy at that point in the conversation was very clear with me. She's like, look, if anything, he's not gonna leave his cigarettes behind. That just really, really doesn't make sense. Um, so once again, just kind of looking at this whole situation, uh, it's really tough for me to get a good sense of what's going on here. Another part of this story is that he had gone out hiking with some friends. Uh, these are people that no one seems to be familiar with. And uh, he had mentioned something about those friends had ditched him or left him behind. Just another kind of weird aspect to this story. I, I don't know how these, these pieces fit together. I'm not proclaiming that. I'm just relaying to you guys what I've heard through all this. And I'm hoping that some of this information might trigger a memory for someone out there that is close enough to this situation or prompt someone to um, call in some tips on this because uh, I don't know, it's, it's a really, really tough case. So his mother does not live very close to this area. It takes her, I think, more than a couple hours to drive to where this Walmart is. So uh, the footage that he was seen on, that was at 3.33. And sometime around 6 p.m., his mother arrives at Walmart they look for him outside, they don't see him. She goes into the Walmart, goes all through it, cannot find him. Uh, so at that point, she says, you know what, I'm going to call T back because she got that phone call from T and says, you know, I have his phone number, I might as well call him back to get some information. Uh, she got kind of some general directions to his house, uh, basically finding out that it was five miles back down 408. Uh, so she starts driving back and forth up there, just looking over and over uh, for BJ. Now, T had described where he lives. He had mentioned that there was a church at the end of the road. They didn't find it that night, but the next morning they went back out searching and she found the church. Uh, pretty soon after she found the church, she found BJ's vehicle. Like I mentioned, it wasn't locked. The wallet was in there, full pack of cigarettes and the medication that he had picked up that morning. Um, so... His mom takes the vehicle to Walmart, like I said, she has a key, and parks it there and leaves a note on it. She's assuming that if you know something slowed him down or he eventually gets there, at least he'll see his vehicle, he'll see the note, he'll know that they're looking for him. According to Jancy, this move kind of confused police and might have um, put them down a path of thinking that BJ was in hiding that his mom was helping to keep him in hiding or something like that. Uh, I don't understand a whole lot about this. You know, BJ has had previous run-ins with the law. Uh, one of the other points of clarification is his tattoo. Remember the date that we talked about uh, that was tattooed on him? That is a sobriety date. And that goes back to 2014. His mom was very clear that um, she felt like he was sober. He had not relapsed since going through all that. So... I don't know why police would have thought this, um, but they apparently thought it was kind of weird that she decided to move the vehicle uh, on her own. And I think it kind of took them in a, in a bit of a different direction in terms of the investigation. But thankfully, it seems like that has been corrected uh, at this point. There was another aspect that was talked about in terms of what police might be considering. There was apparently some type of hunting camp that had a broken window that was about three miles away. 
uh, and police thought perhaps BJ had broken into that building, tried to steal something, got scared, ran off, uh, thought that he might be identified from his shoe prints, so decided to ditch his shoes. Uh, they looked into that hunting camp and apparently nothing was missing. So it didn't seem like he actually took anything. Uh, if he did, you know, intend on s stealing something from there or not. Uh, and it is worth noting, BJ was not working at this time. Uh, he did do body work uh, on vehicles and he was a painter. Um, but he stopped working, I believe, uh, around April. So it had been a couple of months at this point that he wasn't working. Was he stressed out about that? Could that have induced some of whatever he was going through emotionally? I think that's certainly possible. Uh, you know, his mom was having to help him float the bills uh, while him and I believe Tori wasn't working at this point either. So I imagine that finances were a really tough thing. Uh, as far as I know, he has no history of theft or anything like that. So I don't I don't know if it's really reasonable to think that he was going out trying to steal something. His mom said that he was basically, you know, uh, selling his stuff online, selling his own stuff online just to try to get some cash in to, to keep floating them. Uh, the camouflage backpack was a little bit of an interesting story because when I asked Karen and Mandy about it, they actually don't recall that backpack at all. Um, but Tori his girlfriend does say, yes, that is his backpack. According to Jancy, uh, he would usually keep in that backpack some uh, type of emergency supplies for like hiking and stuff like that, as well as water. Uh, so if he did have that backpack with him, which according to all the information we've seen, he did, uh, if he did hurt himself in some way, he probably would have been able to, you know, take care of some minor types of, of injuries. Another uh, interesting point is he had only lived in this area for about a year and a half, and uh, apparently he didn't have a whole lot of friends out there. His mom talked about a particular incident where he needed to get a car part to fix their vehicle, and he actually called his mom to give him a ride to the auto parts shop. And she's like, really, you want me to drive a couple hours out there and a couple hours home so I could take you, you know, to a local auto parts shop? Don't you, have, don't you know anyone out there? And apparently he didn't. So I'm kind of curious about this whole angle that he had these friends that he was hiking with that ditched him. I've also heard a different take on the story where he was meeting up with his friends at Walmart. Um, I don't know. They had only moved to Seneca in December of 2015. So you're talking about a year and a half that they lived there. His mom also told me about some rumor mill stuff that's kicking around that a story is that his mom actually took him to Titusville to buy drugs, which is kind of crazy, according to his mom. She insists that she would never do anything like that. Um, you know, I, I would think that she's probably a pretty big fan of his sobriety, especially considering that he had gone through some of that stuff before. Uh, but that is just part of the rumor mill that's also swirling around all of this. In terms of issues between him and his girlfriend, which I did ask about several times, no one really notes any particular issues. Jancy said that she had spoken to Tori. Tori said that they were getting along fine. Uh, Karen and Mandy didn't hear about him having any issues with his girlfriend in particular. So I don't think there's, at least from what I can find, any uh, you know emotionally charged conversation outside of the possibility that I mentioned before with her possibly letting him know uh, that she was pregnant. But his mother says he probably would have been excited to actually hear that news. So I don't know that that would have thrown him into some type of emotional despair or, or something like that as well. Also to kind of support that he didn't have a relapse or something like that, police did review his phone records. Uh, it was very straightforward. There was calls to his sister, calls to his mother. Uh, there was one number that they couldn't identify initially, but they eventually did, and it turned out to be a telemarketer. So uh, outside of that, there was nothing found on his phone, which you know, typically if someone is uh, having a relapse or something like that, I think you're going to find some trace of that uh, on their phone unless they have a secondary phone or they're, they're trying to hide that information. But I, I just don't see that being in play here. So I know I mentioned earlier the last ping. It was about a half mile from uh, T's house. Uh, it, the area had been searched thoroughly. Nothing has been found. His mom also mentioned that he always wears a ball cap and apparently he wasn't wearing one when he showed up uh, at this neighbor's house. So 
uh, outside of, I mean, we have the shoes recovered, but other things that are missing, we know his car keys are missing somewhere. We know uh, his ball cap could also be another item that can be found out there somewhere. I asked them if he was familiar with this area in terms of, you know, was he a hunter or something like that? Uh, his mother said he used to hunt, but he hadn't in many, many years. Jancy kind of alluded to that he might like to go hiking or kind of out for walks and stuff like that. Um, I really didn't get the same sense from his mother or sister on that. So I, I'm, I'm a little divided. Uh, but they did mention that it is extremely thick in those woods and it would have been probably a lot faster if he was walking that full five miles all the way to Walmart for him to stay on the road because the trails and all the back brush that you run into is extremely thick. It's not like you can even keep up a decent walking pace back there. So just another aspect. Uh, also, the area back there, there are... Um, uh, it's it's zoned for hunting. I believe there's also a rifle range somewhere back there. Um, some other things that are going on in that area that may or may not play into this case. Jancy made a very um, interesting point. She has actually joined a local hunting group specifically so she could share information about this case there with local hunters that might be out there and might come across BJ. I thought that was a really clever uh, thing to do. So I wanted to mention that in this video for anyone else that is ever facing uh, a challenge like uh, having a missing loved one like this. Um, you know, think about what types of organizations might be using that type of land and then get in with those organizations so you can share that information. I thought that was really, really clever. And let me just say at this point, um, the family is in a state where they're very hurt and Jancy is doing an amazing job of being the quarterback for kind of drumming up all the interest, you know, getting the media to look at this case, reaching out to me, um, even reaching out to all of you in the comment thread on last week's video. So I just wanted to give a very big thank you to Jancy for being the quarterback here because it's really tough for a mother to handle something like this or a sister and to try to take on all these things uh, in terms of the search effort when they're dealing with all the very hard emotions of having their son or their brother missing. Uh, so it's really special to me that Jancy's helping them out. And I just wanted to point that out so all you guys know. There's some pretty amazing people uh, out there. And just as a reminder to Karen that there are people out here that want to help you, people that you don't even know yet. Um, just be open to that help when when they do offer it. Don't be too proud or afraid to take it for some reason. There's a lot of very good people out here that really want to help. Now, I know someone on the channel on the comment thread was asking about a body of water that they noticed on the map. I, I saw that body of water as well. I asked his family about it according to what they know. Um, there's people that walked around it, but that particular body of water has not been searched uh, within, you know, going actually into it. Um, that's probably one of the toughest aspects of this case, and it's why I'm going to try to help in some way. I think the best next step here, um, and it's weird because I don't want you guys to feel like I've given up on the hope that BJ could be found alive and healthy. I think that there is a chance of that. I don't know how big that chance is, but according to the information we know, you know, he doesn't have his shoes. He left his wallet behind. Cell phone hasn't been used since he went missing. Uh, didn't even take a, his pack of cigarettes, left his medication behind. Uh, all this family that cares about him has not been contacted. Um, we have to consider the possibility that maybe something happened to him and maybe his body is out there somewhere. Uh, so something I'm really trying to help the family with is getting in particular, a trained cadaver dog out there to search the path, the five miles between where he was last sighted and that Walmart and see if they can detect something. The real shame in this case, after speaking to Karen and Mandy, is in terms of search efforts, it's not the biggest search effort that I've ever seen for a missing persons case. Let me just put it that way. Uh, let me get, I'll give you guys a, a run through. Um, you know, he goes missing on a Wednesday. So initially, the family is told that there would be a search and rescue effort that would start on Thursday, the 29th. It didn't happen. Then they're told that it's been delayed. It's actually going to happen the following day. That also didn't happen. 
Um, then they were told that a chopper was going to go up and start a search at noon. Uh, so the family went out there. Um, they called at about 1235. They were told that the chopper is indeed looking and that police cruisers are on the way and they're going to basically canvas that five mile section. Um, they, the family parked across the street from where T lives basically, and we're watching for the cruisers. They insist that they never saw one police cruiser and they sat there um, for almost four hours. They said they did hear a chopper, but they didn't see it. And they thought that they would certainly see it because they were basically right where the search should be going on, the, the location where they were parked. Um, when they talk to the authorities after this, uh, someone tells them, yes, we know that a chopper was up because I was basically in the chopper. And, you know, we had cruisers out there and Karen basically told them, you know what, we were there and I didn't see any cruisers out there. Um, so the search effort that we know did happen was there was uh, Karen and a bunch of people that get out there. And for two days, they did a nine person search. Um, there was also firefighters and a canine search and rescue that came out for a few hours uh, on the first weekend. But of course, they didn't find anything as well. So uh, something interesting that was told to them when they were kind of being coached on how to conduct their search by the authorities is to be careful of bears when searching and particularly when it was starting to get dark because that's when the bears would come out. So Another thing we have to consider here is the possibility of an animal attack, which I know is another question that many of you were asking uh, in the comments last week. So, And I think just points us towards uh, the importance of getting a uh, trained cadaver search and rescue team out there. Uh, so what I have done over the past day is I've looked into it. I found several companies, uh, in particular in Pennsylvania, one of them servicing the exact location that BJ went missing in. Uh, I forwarded the information for two companies that I think are both within a reasonable distance uh, to the family. The trick here is those companies require law enforcement to ask them. But there's no charge. These companies, they do it based on donations. They do it with volunteer help. Um, so there's no fees that will be incurred from law enforcement to the family, anything. The only catch is the family has to get law enforcement to basically ask for that resource from these companies. So I've sent the information to Jancy, to Karen. Uh, I'm asking them to speak to whoever's the lead investigator on this now to see if they can possibly get that person to request these resources. We just need you to check five miles. That's all we're looking for. Bring a trained cadaver dog out there, check that five miles, see if we can find out what happened to BJ or if we could potentially rule out Maybe he's not out there. Maybe there's some other aspect of this case we haven't thought of. Maybe he got picked up by someone. Maybe he met up with these friends that we don't know about. There's certainly other aspects to this case that might have removed him from that area. I would love to rule out that area. And right now, based on the types of searches that we've heard about that have happened there, I don't think we can rule out that he might still be out in that area waiting to be found. That's kind of where I'm at with it right now, guys. Uh, it's a real tough one. Uh, it's really tough to speak to a family that has had their hope broken a little bit. Um, I'm hoping myself that this video is going to help, that possibly this approach that we're going to try of getting the investigator to talk to these organizations might help get some movement in this. This family deserves answers. They deserve a fair shot at finding BJ. I want to make sure that happens because... The story that I was told when I t when I spoke to all of them, uh, I, c I can't look at this camera right now and tell all of you that I feel like uh, every resource has been used here, uh, which I don't know how many cases I could tell you that, but I can tell you in this case in particular, um, the amount of searching that's been done has been pretty minimal compared to a lot of the cases that I review. So I'm hoping that this new direction that I'm suggesting might help prompt some further action. Let's bring in these people that are amazing enough to volunteer their talent, their resources, and their time. And let's see if they can help crack the case of where BJ is. My heart goes out to you, Karen, Mandy, and Jancy. And thank you so much for spending some time 
uh, with me, letting me know more about this case. And I'm really hopeful that there's something we can do to help bring BJ home. Thank you, everyone, for watching this. Uh, if you have friends in the Pennsylvania area, please, please, please share this video with them. We need to raise exposure to BJ. We need more people to know that he's out there, that he's missing, that there's a family that wants him to come home. Uh, contact information is in the description box below. If you think you have any information that could help with this potentially, please, please contact the authorities and get it to them so they can act on it. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you back here tomorrow on the Lord and Arts channel.